cold um, is a real hazard to the production and also to the workers who uh, uh, do cannabis work. So those are the classic uh, hazards. And then musculoskeletal, we get into a more hybrid area where the hazards are ergonomic risks as well as physical hazards. But the ergonomic risks are from repetitive stress injury. Trimming is a large part of cannabis production, and it's basically repetitive work with the scissors causing a cumulative tra trauma injury to hand muscles and tendons. And um, this is a, I, I guess I could say unique to cannabis production and it's a major employer. And as you'll see, the majority of our subjects uh, we studied were trimmers. <clears throat> there are then physical hazards, electrical, cuts, abrasions, compressed gas explosion. Compressed gas explosion is because of uh, oil extraction of cannabis plants. About 70% of the cannabis produced is, is converted to cannabis oil for export. And um, it's a high pressure gas uh, process that has the risk of fire and explosion and uh, gas exposure. And then we get into the new areas, workplace violence, robbery, assault. And there are two main reasons for this. One is the remote location of these workers. These are not workers in large uh, concentration, but there are a few workers in very distant locations. And the cash economy that exists for cannabis production. So, because of its illegal status at the federal level, a lot of the workers are paid in cash. And so, they're a vulnerable population for robbery and assault. And that's a reality of this workplace. So, um, this is, takes us into a new area of uh, known hazards. Now, the challenges of studying cannabis workers are enormous. <clears throat> There's no registry. Illegal status further compounds the challenge of obtaining representative health data. And so even in agriculture, there have been a few large worker population studies, um, you know, not as many as in other working populations, but there have been a few, but none of that exists in uh, cannabis production. In fact, most of the things that have been published have been single workplaces or fewer than that. Um, and that makes it difficult to get, get quantitative data on the actual risk of workers. Um, but uh, there, we can reach conclusions and we'll go through some of that and talk about how we achieve those goals. And you know, so here are, Again, listing out the different areas that we focused on, respiratory hazards, dermatitis, allergic reactions, ergonomic, including in repetitive stress injuries, physical injuries, and personal safety, especially for women. Now, trimmigrants is the colloquialism that's given to immigrants who come in to do trimming work. And uh, here we see a difference from classic agricultural workers. Um, these are often college educated students, young working professionals who come to earn money in large amounts from short time duration of working, uh, often on vacation or tourist visas. And that's different from classic agriculture in that they're younger, they're more educated. Uh, there's a substantial percentage of US citizens who do this work, as well as immigrants. And, um, you know, the traditional immigrant farm worker is low educated, uh, low, uh, high poverty level, and um, looks different from the trimmigrant uh, who's doing cannabis work. Now, where they're coming from, uh, mostly Latino, but increasingly Asian and European immigrants. As it got, became known, uh, this became a popular destination for immigrants to come and gain money over a short working season of three to five months. Um, now, interestingly, there's some preference for 
the foreign immigrant workers among the growers uh, because they have less distraction, they just want to work, or whereas the U.S. citizens often have distraction and are not as reliable, according to the growers. Now, in this picture, you can see the casual nature of the trimming environment. I mean, you know, there are beach chairs and lawn chairs and, you know, uh, casual environment. Uh, it's not a organized workplace and this may this would be a large workforce you know six people or so many of them are fewer doing the trimming work next slide and stella while you're making that switch could could you um try switching it in, out of presenter mode please i'm so sorry i did not know that it was in presenter mode for you guys i really really apologize and I'm really sorry about that. Um, let's see. You'd think in um, you know 2023 at this point we would I would have worked this one out, but oh, here we are. I'm glad you're driving. <laughs> okay, let me give this one more try. I mean, I'll keep trying as long as I need to. Are we back in the saddle here? Yeah, but you're on the first slide. Okay. Close your eyes for a second, everybody. I don't know how to advance. Hey, go, go. go back. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. This is uh, my worst experience yet with Zoom. Okay, are we looking good now? I think the, go back one. Go back one. Yeah, okay. Now I got a couple more slides and then I'm finished there. Next slide. Next slide. So the, taking all that into consideration, we designed a study of qualitative data gathering to look at the hazards, the diverse hazards of cannabis workers. Uh, this was a collaborative effort between UC Davis and UC Berkeley Health Initiative of the Americas. And it was funded by the California Department of Cannabis Control. And I should mention that it's one of the very few maybe the only occupational health uh, study that was funded by the Department of Cannabis Control. That's not their forte, and they didn't spend much effort in funding that. Next slide. So this was a study of focus group discussions and key informant interviews. <clears throat> we uh, conducted four focus groups of 32 workers total and nine key informant interviews of workers, owners, managers, and safety consultants. There was a semi-structured guide of health and safety topics that was went, gone through in both of these settings. And the thematic analysis was compiled and uh, written into transcripts by multiple note takers. Um, next slide. All of our subjects had worked as trimmers, but seven had done field cultivation experience. And these were often workers who were year round workers as opposed to short term three to four month trimmers. Five had worked in extraction labs, five were bud tenders, and two were delivery drivers. And uh, 26 were uh, uh, immigrant. Um, the pay was usually in cash under the table. These are undocumented illegal workers and uh, they're paid in cash. And that, you know, again, is one of the tragic uh, realities of this workforce. Others are paid in other means. Um, they're most commonly paid in a piece rate for trimming. And that used to be $150 per pound, but now has gone down with increased production to less than $100. Uh, and cultivating work was paid hourly. Next slide. And this just gives you the demographics of our study population. It was split male and female. The majority were from Mexico, but notice 20% uh, were US citizens. And 75% had some college education. So very different from the classic agricultural worker population. Uh, Latino were 
percent or so white, black, other made up the difference. Um, and uh, age, the mean or median was 33, relatively young again, uh, compared to agricultural workers. And most had worked for less than a year, uh, the median being nine months. And I'm gonna stop there and we're gonna go into the results uh, with uh, Stella. All right, hi. So I'm gonna talk, the, we kind of divided the results from the study into three sort of domains. We had physiologic exposures and health effects, which I'm gonna start with. And then Sochi will talk about structural violence and control of the, the workers. And then we'll shift back to an analysis we did of stress and co uh, coping mechanisms. So for physiologic exposures, what our findings were, were pretty consistent with the uh, sort of anticipated exposures and effects that Dr. Schenker was talking about. Our participants talked about being exposed to the cannabis plant, like dust and resin, mold. Uh, they talked a lot about trimming moldy weed, pesticides. A few of the participants had stories about applying pesticides with like not appropriate gear, and they were all also exposed to wildfire smoke. Um, they also had consistent health effects, things like respiratory symptoms, coughing, shortness of breath, rashes. We had one participant who had really severe eye irritation from contact with resin, which I guess is an occupational hazard. One of our participants said, I had an allergy on my face, arms, and body. I tried to cover my body, but it was not helpful. I'm not sure if it was from weed or fungus. After that, I have long-term allergies to weed that I didn't have before. So for musculoskeletal disorders, that was another main issue. Um, the trimmers worked, you know, usually around 10 or 12 hour days, sometimes up to 13. And they all almost always brought their own chair, which was like a camping chair, one of those canvas ones. Uh, sometimes that was the best available seating, but they would sit for these shifts sort of hunched over a tray of cannabis trimming it. And they talked about having largely back pain, uh, but with some shoulder, hand, and wrist pain, and that this would not only occur while they were working, but also, you know, at night after they stopped working, and then sometimes even after they returned home long after uh, the, the work season. Another thing they talked about was physical hazards. Uh, there was a lot of concern about electrical hazards. One of our participants said like his worst fear on the job was getting electrocuted because there was just extension cords, daisy chained together, lying in puddles, things like that. Uh, the on-site housing for seasonal workers is really substandard. Sometimes they'll have like a camper van, but typically they're sleeping in a tent or in their car. Uh, a lot of people talked about having unsanitary bathrooms or even no bathrooms and unsanitary cooking facilities. And then um, one thing that I think was a little unexpected was a lot of participants talked about being chronically exposed to cold. Um, they're up there in the mountains towards the end of the season, it starts getting really cold at night and cannabis is stored cold to protect the quality. So people just were cold at work and cold off work and it was troublesome. And there's been, uh, some of our participants talked about potential carbon monoxide exposure. Um, and there's been a few cases in the news, sadly, where cannabis workers have died from uh, propane heaters being used indoors. One of our participants who is an extraction worker um, talked about um, a flammable, like a solvent extraction system and the business owner didn't tell anybody that he didn't know how to use it. So this worker said, there's no certification for a lot of things. That guy didn't tell anyone he didn't know how to run the machine. They all learn on the job with $100,000 equipment risking people's lives. A lot of people were in danger. It was a building that could have exploded. So I'm gonna hand it over to Sochi now for our discussion of structural violence. Thank you, Stella. And thank you to the Ag Center for uh, allowing us to present this innovative study. I just want to mention how wonderful it has been to work with you, Stella, and how prolific has been this project. We have three articles that have been uh, and are gonna be published in major journals because our findings are not just the traditional. So let me start and I want to have a moment with you guys who are um, listening to us or watching this presentation. 
sharing a quote from my beloved friend and colleague, Paul Farmer. He said, structural violence is one way of describing social arrangements that put individuals and populations in harm's way. The arrangements are structural because they are embedded in the political and economic organization of our social world. They are violent because they can cause injury to people. How profound is this? So let me talk about these structural factors. And one of them, and by the way, it's not just for this occupation, means cannabis industry, but in general, is the big divider in a society that is based on, on rights. And the first right is the right that gives you being a citizen. Uh -huh. So if you are not a citizen, you don't have rights to many other privileges, including, for example, you know, things that you are contributing because many entering in this country as undocumented workers, but once they are hired, they don't ask your documentation status, but you have to pay the taxes that are subsidizing citizens. But that's another conversation. Let me talk then about this industry that really, uh, in terms of immigration, the stress described by the participants begin well beyond, begin before crossing the board. For instance, they have strategies, including, for example, choosing airports to have a better chance of avoiding interrogations, and, you know, for example, deleting from their cells or from anything they have their data because they know they can be subjects of detention. I want to read a quote of one of the participants said, last year I traveled with my boyfriend and he's an almost white man and they did not arrest him. They kept me for several hours in the detention room. I'm a brunette and with indigenous features from me. So, you know, the fact that they experience um, employment situation where the bosses or owners are leveraging their workers' status, meaning undocumented, to exploit them is very common in this industry. The industry really also divide the people, you know, by race, especially in the rural areas, growth are usually done by white men. The owners are white men. Most of the participants had experienced a manager or an owner using racist language or paying white US or Europeans workers more. They are like, you know, if you have as the color of the skin counts. Since immigrant workers are racialized, even the participants who have self identified themselves as white experience this kind of discrimination as Latin American immigrants. One of the things is that undocumented workers have the same legal rights for safe at workplaces than other workers, including workers' compensations. But these rights, rights are de facto. They are not necessarily accessible due to the fears and punishment by employers or job loss, as well as exposure to law enforcement. So consistently we know other agricultural products hiring undocumented workers who accept lower pay and avoiding insurance and payroll taxes benefits licensed cannabis producers. Next, gender. Uh -huh. We talk these days about DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. Mm -hmm. If we put a no on this, no diversity, the majority are undocumented. Not equity, 
and not inclusion, we will understand better this. All of the women participants talk about sexual harassment. Trimming has traditionally been the cannabis job held by women. A lot of people in the industry think that women are better trimmers, but it's also one of the least prestigious jobs. Sometimes they are called trim bitches. From our focus groups and other literature review and news reports that you might be aware of, trimming is considered a very hazardous in terms of being assaulted or experienced harassment. And women work in at least pairs, if not with groups, for safety or some travel with male partners to be protected. Some participants mentioned that there have been news reports or things like women being kidnapped, but, but in our study, that was not the case. I want to, to, to highlight that. Next, abuse of power. <laughs> that is, uh, really something that is the center of this Wild West industry. And I want to talk about two structural factors that have been aspects that are unique to the cannabis industry. The first one is the workplace power imbalance that is very common, especially in low wage work. And it's amplified, amplified here by the isolation and attitudes that are either kind of a holdover from outlaw growing or fostered by situations of illegal growing. Most of the participants talk about just generally abusive workplaces. They are experiencing this racism and discrimination from the bosses and they are clearly not being valued as workers or as a human beings when they are even sleeping in tents or not even having access to showers, but they have to use hoses. And we are living in the golden state. We are talking about California. Um, <laughs> so sometimes that's really notable. I and mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 really, you know, enforce the enforcement with guns. I want to, to, if you go to the next, please, to this quote that says, you are at the disposition of a crazy person on the top of a hill. Remember, they live in places where there is like eight hours to arrive to their workplace and they don't trust you. They have been a couple of, a couple of times that I have had a gun pointed to my head because the owner get paranoid and they think you are stealing. If they don't pay you, it's not like that you can get a bigger gun and come back. Next. So that, go, that brings me to my last slide and is the criminalization of the industry. Another factor related specifically to the cannabis industry is that it's still is illegal at the federal level. And in California, most cannabis is still produced on illegal roads or very great zones. We ask in the focus group, what the most things that could, what, what could be the worst thing that could happen to you? And they answer, the rates and not being paid. And these rates are not uncommon and they are terrifying for the workers. Remember, the majority are undocumented. There are these federal agencies like the DEA, as well as state agencies and local sheriffs and police that are really catching this. You see in the news sometimes or hear from these agencies that there will be fingerprinting or photographs and release low level workers and only the managers and owners are arrested. But these are still interactions with armed law enforcement and workers are constantly on the edge. But this 
um, this is is, 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 is is part of the of the business. Cannabis business still not generally legal, even though it's the number one industry in the agricultural field in California. And uh, don't generally have access to people, for example, to go to the banks. And so there's a lot of cash going there. And uh, in the case of trimmers, the majority are paying in cash. And they have their monies and there is very common. We have heard like in communities like Garberville or, or Covello, uh, trimmers are robbed. So the vulnerabilities here are really at the, at the, the, at the very uh, constant part of the day. Uh, next one. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. Uh, Stella, you wanna go? Sure, please? yeah. Wonderful, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, we had a paper that was just published on that analysis, which I think for all of us was kind of a labor of love. It's a, a wonderful paper and I'm hoping that everybody uh, can check it out. It's an open access paper too. So I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna try to go pretty quick cause I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for questions at the end, but just to talk about the third um, theme we identified, which was the feelings of stress of the workers, their coping mechanisms and a big stressor was isolation. So the sources of stress, a lot of what the trimmers talked about was production pressure, trying to work as hard as they can, as fast as they can to make their money. Um, these long shifts and the boredom that it, it's a really, um, it's a detailed job and a skilled job, but it's also a very repetitious job. So one of the things the trimmer said was you can go crazy looking at the same person and doing the same thing. You start to forget if you're working for two days or for two weeks, it just kind of starts to run together for them and it's a really stressful situation. Isolation, again, uh, Dr. Schinker talked about just for access to medical care, isolation is a big hazard. Um, people also are unable to contact their friends and family for long periods of time. There's not much cell phone access or internet access when you get up into the mountains. Um, and people, one of the workers talked about almost like disappearing when, when she got up there. And then another factor for the trimmers, the seasonal workers was being, um, uh, living on the work site with the same people and just a lot of tension and conflict based on uh, living in the same place, working with the same people and then living with them day after day. Some of the couple of the workers said that mental health problems were inevitable doing cannabis work, seasonal cannabis work, something like depression or anxiety are just going to happen if you're a cannabis worker. They talk about feeling stressed out all the time. And another aspect is that the workers talk about um, owners, cannabis farm owners, becoming increasingly paranoid and angry throughout the, the cannabis season as time goes on. Um, they talked about some different coping mechanisms for stress. Uh, one of the main ones was just altering their work rate or taking breaks. I think all of the participants knew they should take breaks to rest physically and mentally. Um, but as one of them said, the thing about it is that the more you do, the more money you earn. So repetition becomes a race. So um, they try to um, either sort of play games with themselves to keep going or um, just think about the money that they're making. And then some people talked about socializing. Others talked about actually wanting to be distant. One worker said like sort of one of the fringe benefits of COVID was that she was able to kind of sit further away from other people and be a little more isolated. So I wanna preface by saying we really can't say from this study whether substance use was the main coping mechanism um, or if it was just that something were people were concerned about. So maybe they talked about it a lot because it was something they were worried about. And we, I don't want this to be taken to say that substance use is a big problem among seasonal cannabis workers because it really could have just been something they were the most concerned about. Um, as we said before, um, a lot of people come into the cannabis industry who are interested in cannabis or you know being involved in the culture. Some of them talked about using cannabis um, medicinally to relieve pain or to relax. Um, some Trimmer seasonal workers, none of our participants said that they personally use drugs, but they did say that consumption of some stimulants, uh, MDMA, 
were um, present among trimmers and also that white and European trimmers and farm owners were um, more likely to use drugs than the seasonal workers or the Latino workers. Um, so I think uh, I will give a couple sort of really big picture overviews of our conclusions and recommendations and we can all, um, maybe if Dr. Schenker and uh, Dr. Castaneda wanna talk a little bit about those two. Um, and a big important point is that we just talked about a lot of bad things happening to cannabis workers and a lot of bad employers, but there are a lot of cannabis workers who do really care about worker health. There's workers or there's owners who take, you know, voluntary extra training to try to protect their workers' health. Um, licensed businesses are required to provide a 30-hour OSHA training course to one, um, one manager and one employee. Unfortunately, it's not super well enforced, but the trainings are out there. And there's also community organizations that are present and could grow to really help cannabis workers. Um, we did ask why they do this work. Why do they come back and do this sometimes season after season? And a lot of it is money. Um, people coming from Mexico or South America can live for the rest of the year in their home country on one season of trimming. They also enjoy the adventure, um, the beautiful scenery in Northern California. And some of them are uh, come to the work out of an interest in cannabis. Um, I think the findings that we talked about, a lot of them are common to agricultural work. You know, not only the like respiratory and dermal hazards, but the unsanitary housing and abuse experienced by other undocumented workers. But the, um, the fact that cannabis is federally criminalized and so much of it in California is still grown unlicensed the isolation and then some cultural factors um, like what our participants and other people call like a wild west attitude is, is more unique to cannabis. Um, training, none of the workers in our study received training, um, not, not even the workers who were in dispensaries or working on solvent extraction, they didn't receive training. Um, and even on job tasks, like uh, for trimmers, usually it was another trimmer that took time away from their work to teach like a new trimmer how to work. They weren't instructed on um, job tasks. What they recommended, what they thought would help the most would be a mechanism to ensure pay. Um, they tried to share information about bad employers, but wage theft is very common. Um, and they also wanted they said that adequate living conditions for the seasonal workers were one of their big recommendations. Um, so moving forward to advanced cannabis worker health, one of the big things, you know, you saw nobody had received training is that um, training materials need to be available, not through employers, and that would be great too, but through community organizations, social media, things that are targeted to different linguistic groups. Um, and made broadly available. Uh, legalization or decriminalization at the federal level is gonna be a big step in the right direction, right? So businesses will have access to banking. The um, Cannabis Legalization Act that's currently sort of waiting to be acted on at the federal level does include research funding targeted for worker health and safety. And there'll be, um, I mean, the problems will still be there for undocumented workers, but there'll be a lot more legal jobs in the cannabis industry. And um, this work needs to include all workers. Uh, it needs to include, you know, undocumented seasonal workers, um, not just people who work at uh, licensed cannabis businesses, you know, in the Bay Area. And this is our list of references, which will be in the webinar. Um, I know there's a lot to read here. I'm sure if you contacted any one of us, we'd be very happy to share these resources uh, with you. But this is um, what we have. Uh, available. And I will say thank you and um, hope we've left plenty of room for, for Q&A and also ask if um, the project PIs here have anything to add to, to what I've said about our recommendations and conclusions. Okay. Um, Heather, I don't know if you're talking, but you're muted. Ah, thank you so much. Yeah, Stella, if you could pull down those slides and um, 
and that way we can see everybody. We do have some questions. And um, Elena, if you'd like to also, there we go. We can see see all of us. Um, so thank you so much for such an informative presentation. Uh, unfortunately, we do hear a lot about cannabis, but we do not hear enough about the, the workers who are um, tending it and producing it and the hazardous, hazards they might be facing. So early on, we did receive a question about the estimating of the number of workers. Um, can you describe how you obtained that number of um, number of workers? Well, we rely on our colleague, Dan Sumner, who's done a lot of work on ag economics, including major report on the uh, cannabis industry. And, you know, I would have to defer to him in terms of uh, how he came up with that estimate. But, um, you know, the nature of the work really is pretty clear that their adequate counting doesn't go on. I mean, you know, a lot of these growth areas are trying to be invisible. And um, so that, that's all I can say in terms of that. I can't give the methodology. Thank you. And then um, both, I guess, in that estimate, but then also in your study, I, I missed if you specified whether or not the or the proportion of your sample was um, of legal operations versus non-legal operations. Did you did you go to both types of farms? Well, ours was a convenient sample, and um, we, you know, often did it by hearsay in terms of getting uh, volunteers. And it was a mixture. The majority were undocumented workplaces or illegal workplaces, but there were some legal workplaces as well. And, um, you know, I must say also that there are hybrid locations. So in some of these places, you know, for certain purposes, they were legal with the state of California, but for other purposes, they were <laughs> illegal. For paying the workers, it was usually illegal. Um, but for other purposes, they were legal. So it's a, a mixed bag, but, you know, the, the majority of the production is still illegal in California. As a reminder, everyone is welcome to put questions into the chat. Um, okay, a, a recent a question that just came in. Did you see any evidence of child labor? No, um, we we didn't. And the, um, the investigative reports that have come out recently on the cannabis industry, I don't, I don't think child labor was identified as a big problem or a, a problem. I just want to emphasize the stress of doing this work. I mean, these workers are working 13 hours a day, six to seven days a week for several months in succession. It's unbelievable even thinking about that kind of repetitive stress. And, um, you know, I just want to emphasize this is that there's a probably a large survivor population of those who are able to continue that kind of work. Um, so you talked about the convenient sample. I know you did. Um, it was a qualitative study, but there are a couple questions about survey. Um, can you describe the the survey approach? Did was a survey done and was it distributed widely, or can you discuss that a little bit for the viewers? Um, I, sure. So we recruited. Um, it was a convenient sample. A lot of the recruiting was done by word of mouth, so we didn't go to businesses and recruit for this study. Um, uh, and this, so it wasn't a survey. We recruited, like I said, word of mouth. We had a flyer and we worked through some like labor partners and some industry partners for recruitment um, and pulled people into these really collaborative focus groups and key informant interviews. Um, and there was a brief demographic survey just to collect that, that information, but it was like a purely interview driven study, not a uh, a survey driven study. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, would you say pesticide exposure is a greater or lower occupational risk when compared to other hazards cannabis workers are exposed to? That's a hard question to, to answer. Um, it exists, and you know, when you have an illegal workplace, 
the usual controls on both the materials being used and uh, their application don't exist. Now, the greatest safety in terms of pesticides is the control, the testing of cannabis product that gets into the legal market, where there's very strict controls in terms of what pesticides can exist on their cannabis. But that's an indirect benefit. And, um, you know, I can't answer the question specifically except to say the risk does exist. And the fact of this being illegal workplaces exacerbates that risk. Um, Stella, early on when you were presenting at the beginning, you talked about wildfire smoke exposure and um, wondering if you could give um, a little bit more information about that, especially because of the overlap between exposures that um, cannabis workers might be exposed to because of their occupation, but also the wildfire smoke patterns due to the geography of where cannabis cultivation occurs. Yeah, that's that's definitely a big a big overlap between the two areas, and also with the harvest season, the outdoor cannabis harvest season is usually like September, October, November. So what we would call wildfire season. Um, all of the workers talked about wildfire smoke exposure. None of our participants had like had to evacuate, um, but it was definitely a major health issue. They had all experienced like coughing or. Um, you know, shortness of breath, just the usual sort of unpleasant uh, wildfire smoke exposure symptoms. And they didn't have anywhere, the seasonal workers, they didn't have like a building to go into. There was really no way for them to get away from the smoke. We did have one key informant who is a, a small, like a, it's like a cottage uh, licensed cannabis grower who talked about having, she lost um, flowers because the ash came down and then like got wet and like turned into a crust. So they were also experiencing loss of their, their product due to the smoke. But one thing that uh, not just related to wildfires, but you know, to the cold weather is that some of them mentioned that in order to get warm, they were trimming near uh, propane stoves and inhaling that. So perhaps are not necessarily pesticides, but other exposure are more particular to this industry in relation to a prior uh, question that was. They're really jury-rigged workplaces for trimmers. I mean, they bring their own chairs and tables and, uh, you know, set up little heaters and do things to keep warm. And it's, it's, you know, it's the wild west. <laughs> it's... Another thing that I don't know if it, it was clear, but, you know, the use of guns in the area, it's very common. And it's one of the things they fear the most because uh, that puts them in a very vulnerable situation vis-a-vis -vis the owners or other uh, workers who possess the guns. And that is related to structural violence, is related to gender issues and to other inequalities that they are experiencing while doing this job that benefits so much California and many people. Uh, so more attention is needed to the health and safety of these workers. We need to rehumanize them. And, uh, you know, the criminalization of the industry doesn't help. But these are workers that are living and working under very difficult circumstances. You know, living in a tent for a woman, you know, not being able to wash your hair or your yourself uh, very often. Uh, and I said a woman because I was thinking in the menstrual periods or other things we experience as women, it's not easy. So we need to rethink and make an effort for decriminalize the industry, but also to humanize the workers. Uh, really commonly reported. I'd say the majority of the participants reported being underpaid. And, you know, it's tragic because there's nothing they can do. I mean, the employer basically says, this is all I have or this is all you're going to get, you know, and, and that's the end of the discussion. 
And you know, the other thing is we have to face a reality of climate change. And these workers are more exposed to certain type of uh, situations than others in other agricultural industries where they have, well, housing, let's say, you know, when you live in the mountain, eight hours from, you know, quote unquote civilization. What if you have an accident there? There is no cell, there is no, there are not helicopters that will bring you there, you know? So vulnerabilities exist. And that's why we try to put out in our three articles, you know, that are common, but there are others that are more specific to this industry, number one industry, very important industry in the agricultural field in California. So to, to conclude, sort of in the in the last few minutes, I think that um, there's there's some a lot there's a lot happening in the comments that we're not going to be able to get to a lot related to potential collaborations with community organizations, unions. Um, and so forth. A lot, there's a conversation related to um, larger organ, um, employers who ha are running more established um, companies that have strong uh, safety plans and others like a, a traditional um, company would. Um, where do you see opportunities for future research to try to disentangle some of the nuances between um, you know, more between the the legal, the not legal, the big, the small operations, and some of the, it seems like there's a wide range of enterprises. Is Do you have future research questions that you think should be explored? Um, where would you pursue this further? Well, the overriding reality is that legalization would have numerous benefits it's still going to be a challenge and there's still difficulties because of the nature of the work and the workforce and its vocation and so on. But legalization would be the first thing that I would look to, to changing the reality that exists. Um, you know, we could get more specific, but there would be numerous benefits from that. And uh, recognition by, you know, Department of Food and Agriculture of this workplace and its size and magnitude and hazards, um, you know, would uh, hopefully be a benefit that would follow. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Sochil and Stella? Uh, you know, I want to answer Victoria Arana's question about the community organizations. They have established their own community ways, for example, to know where there are abusive workers, where the, they have not been paid. That is very common in the, in the area. It's one of the big fears. So there are blocks among the workers that are working. Um, I, I hope the United uh, Farm Workers will uh, be, you know, working there to unionize some of these workers. The problem is their status. And a lot of, and we are talking about the trimmers, not necessarily the growers. The majority of them are undocumented. And as I said at the beginning, being undocumented limit your rights in this country. And, and 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 elevate your fears. So I want to say thank you to the Western Center for Agricultural uh, say, uh, Health and Safety and to my colleagues and for you, the participants and pay more attention, be tuned and read our articles. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you for coming on today. We really appreciate it. This work is so important and we are so thankful that you are leading the way in it. So thank you all for joining us today. We will be on a summer break and we will be back in October with our next season of seminars. So have a wonderful summer and we will see you then. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.